Hi there, I'm Gary. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been before. So today is Kit of the Week Combo Day. So today we are looking at the Hawker Sea Fury in 148 scale from Airfix. We'll start off with a look at the history of the Hawker Sea Fury. We'll then have a look inside the box and see what you get and what decor options you have, things like that. And finally, we'll show you how to make the kit yourself. All of these bits come as chapters, so you can hop backwards and forwards as your heart desires. Now, if you enjoy the video, please do remember to subscribe to the channel. You do that by clicking on the small logo down there in the bottom right corner. If you'd like to support the channel for future productions, then you can do so through links to Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee, and also to the Airfix online store. Links to all of these are in the information box below. So let's get on with things and have a look at the history of the Hawker Sea Fury. Seen by many as the ultimate piston engine fighter, the Sea Fury was a direct descendant of the Hawker Typhoon and Hawker Tempest fighter bombers of World War II. The design started as a light Tempest, the Tempest II being thought too heavy for proper fighter duties. Created by Hawker's chief designer, Sidney Cam, it utilised a shortened version of Tempest's wing, a fully monocoque fuselage and a higher cockpit for better visibility. Both the RAF and the Royal Navy issued specifications around the concept in 1943, Cam suggesting that the same aircraft with modification could suit both roles. Thus were born the Fury and the Sea Fury. The first Fury to take to the air was powered by the Bristol Centaurus engine, driving a four-bladed propeller on the 1st of September 1944. Further prototypes experimented with a Griffin engine with a six-blade contra-rotating propeller. Later one also flew with a Napier Sabre engine. At 780 km per hour, the fastest piston engined aircraft ever flown by Hawker. As the Second World War drew to a close, the RAF had a surplus of late Mark Spitfires and Hawker Tempests, so cancelled their order for the Fury. But the Royal Navy continued with the Sea Fury to replace the generally unsuitable Sea Fire, and the Vought Corsairs and Grumman Hellcats provided under the Lend Lease Agreement that either had to be purchased or returned to the USA. The prototype Sea Fury with the Centaurus engine flew on the 21st of February 1945 with the second prototype pioneering the new five-bladed propeller. The first production model was the Sea Fury Mark 10, later called the F-10, which flew in September 1946 and entered squadron service the following year. Hawker's continued development of the aircraft resulting in the definitive Sea Fury, the FB-11. This could be used for ground attack as well as being a fighter and was fitted with powered folding wings. The Sea Fury's fame derives from its use during the Korean War in the early 1950s. The first British aircraft carrier on station, HMS Triumph, was equipped with the Seafire FR-47 and the Firefly Mark I, which performed patrol and attack duties in support of UN operations. The first Sea Furies arrived when HMS Theseus relief triumph in October 1950. HMS Theseus, Glory, Ocean and HMAS Sydney all served on station, all flying Sea Furies in addition to other aircraft. In August 1952, a flight of Sea Furies engaged some Chinese MiG-15 jet fighters. One of these was subsequently shot down. It was credited to Lieutenant Peter Carmichael although he always credited the entire flight. More recent research has shown it was likely shot down by Sub-Lieutenant Brian Ellis. After the war, the Royal Australian Navy was credited with a different kind of kill, celebrated on the box art for this kit. On 30th of August 1955, an Oster Archer took off all by itself when the pilot had gone out to swing the prop to start it. Flying in airspace near Sydney, the aircraft was first intercepted by a CAC Wirraway, but the rear gunner was unable to bring the Oster down. Two Gloucester Meteors were scrambled, 
but the Oster was flying at only about 60 knots, much lower than the Meteor's stalling speed. It befell to a pair of Sea Furies of the Royal Australian Navy, flown by Peter McNay and John Blewett, to shoot the unmanned plane down over the sea. Sea Fury fighters and two-seat trainers were exported to other countries, including Canada, the Netherlands, Burma, Cuba, Iraq and Pakistan. By the mid-1950s, many air arms were re-equipping with jets, but several Sea Furies remained airworthy as heritage aircraft and as modified racing machines, where they are still pitted against contemporaries such as the Grumman Bearcat at speeds of over 800 km per hour. The box lid comes off at the top and we find the usual suspects inside. First is a big plastic bag containing all the parts. Then there's a sheet of decals, a layout of the stencils that are common to all schemes, and finally the instruction leaflet. The bag contains five sprues of grey plastic plus one of transparencies. This first sprue contains all the wing sections. Remember this kit has the option of having folded wings. Then there is the fuselage with some flying surfaces and some of the internal structure. On this sprue are the cockpit floor and instrument panel and parts of the undercarriage bays along with many, many drop tanks. The fourth sprue has the huge propeller and the spinner, plus parts for the wing fold. And finally, there's a sprue with the cockpit internals and some 60 pound rockets. The transparency sprue has the windshield, canopy, and wingtip lights, and also a piece of glass that's not used in this version of the kit. All of the parts seem pretty well molded. The Panel lines seem quite deep and wide for this scale, but I guess that will suit the less experienced modeler, people who are trying to do panel lines for the first time and help them make something really special. The engine is sparsely modeled, but then you can't really see very much between the huge propeller boss and the tight cowling. The plastic has a good crisp feel to it, and it takes precise moldings, such as these exhausts that you don't need to drill out. The wing fold mechanism looks pretty straightforward and reasonably realistic. One issue for me is that the underwing lights seem to be just depressions in the skin that get decals added. I mean, even the 172nd Tempest has got a proper glass cover. The instrument panel will take dry brushing if you don't fancy the decals that are supplied. And of course, aftermarket instrument panels are available. There are some encouraging bits of cockpit piping too, so it looks like the walls of the cockpit will be reasonably well modelled. There are occasional bits of flash, but really very, very little and nothing that can't be dealt with, nothing that's going to cause a problem. The undercarriage bay itself is very well detailed, and the tyres have this pleasing tread moulded in. The instructions are very much of the kind these days, Although, unusually, there's more than two colours in the middle. They're clear, they're well drawn, well thought out, and the shading helps enormously. And at the back of the instruction sheets are the three scheme options for this kit. First is an aircraft of 805 Squadron Royal Australian Navy, the one that shot down the unmanned light aircraft in 1955. Apparently the jets around at the time were just too fast to get a good shot off. Scheme B is an aircraft of 803 Squadron Royal Canadian Navy flying from HMCS Warrior in 1948. And finally as an aircraft of the Royal Netherlands Naval Air Service flown as a display aircraft. This is the one I'll build as I can't resist this big orange nose.
There is also this sheet depicting the placement of all the stencils for the aircraft. Fortunately, there aren't too many of these. Onto the decal sheets then, and this is printed by Cartograph. The colours are very good and in perfect register. The sharpness is very fine. This image shows how one may read text that's less than a millimetre high. As is usual for Airfix, the sheet is split into common decals and the optional schemes. Here the common decals are at the top. This includes the instrument decals, walkways, something representing the underwing lights and the various common stencils. Next to the markings for Victor Whiskey 645, that's the Royal Australian Navy aircraft. In the lower half of the sheet are the markings for the Royal Canadian Navy aircraft, Tango Golf 113. Also the markings for the Dutch display aircraft. Note this also has a grey walkway stripe either side on the wing routes. I always start by spraying some pieces on the sprue. Many things I'll do in a base of aluminium before applying a top coat of the interior colour, here black, as I think it gives a nice texture. This includes things like the propeller. I'll also spray the inside of the fuselage. Onto the parts now, and this seat is black, but I'm adding some brown to the leather work. The cockpit tub is black, I'll just dust it with a very fine sanding stick to reveal some of the aluminium highlights below. Then I'll fit the control column and the rudder bar. The instrument panel is already painted black, you can dry brush this if you like or use the decals. In this kit the decals are in small sections meaning you don't have a load of excess clear areas to dry and flatten out. Now, that's a very good idea. And on this front panel I'll bring out some of the rivet details using a thin wash of grey. Onto the construction then and the sit fits onto the rear cockpit member like so. Then the instrument panel goes into the cockpit. It slots into place easily. Then the front bulkhead or the firewall sits at right angles to the floor piece. Then there are two pieces of side structure with various bits of detail, one on each side. And the cockpit tub area is complete. Next I'll spray the base primer of the aircraft. This was called Hawker Yellow. The closest thing I can find is this yellow zinc chromite I got for a Buccaneer kit a while ago. With some weathering it will look better than the linen colour Airfix recommends. It's sprayed on all the exposed internals such as the wheel wells. Now I can fit the cockpit tub into one side of the fuselage. It sits very well on its locator pins. This front spar goes in, as does the tail wheel well. Then the fuselage halves can be attached. This is a pretty good fit, so just tape and clamps as needed to hold it all together. Now the main gear well. First these actuators sit on the main beam of the fuselage. This will be a pain later. The beam then sits into the main wheel well. Note this is painted that yellow chromite as well. The whole thing then goes into the bottom of the wing. Now be careful, the actuator arms stick out below the wing piece. They will get bent and could easily get broken. Very poor design, I think. Anyway, when it's in, clamp it to set. The next bits to fit the gun barrels, here you can see one set has deformed. Now I'm not a plastics engineer, but I would have to guess that the plastic wasn't cooled enough before the moulds actually opened. Normally I'd ask Airfix for a replacement and they would very quickly send me one, but I don't have the time in my schedule. Anyway, the radiator grill goes into place, followed by the guns that survived. I'm going to fix the lower wings of the fuselage now and tape it all together.
While it was drying, I found some 0.75 millimeter round stock I can cut up for the gun barrels. Next, I'll start up on the engine. Here, I've painted it in burnt iron with copper highlighting on the pipes. Now, I don't know if the Centaurus had copper inlet and exhaust pipes or brass or steel or whatever, but they look cool and will be mainly hidden away anyway. Then at the rear end of the cowling is a ring supporting the exhaust stubs. These stubs are really well modelled. But here's a big problem. Now, if you dry fit the cowling, in order to keep the right line between the two rings, the cowling ends up with a gap. So either you have to fill the gap, which is huge, or sand down the rings, which is plainly wrong. So what I ended up doing was fitting the bottom of the cowling first and let that set in, then put in the top half of the cowling so it sits correctly with the rings. Now I've got some thin flat stock that I can trim and put into the gap in pieces. I've done the same on the other side but just sanded the flat stock a bit first as the gap is a bit smaller and it just needed to be a bit thinner. Set everything in with ultra thin glue and leave it for a while. Next I'll assemble the tailplanes. These come in halves with the moulding injection right in the middle of the leading edge. Something that really makes me fed up. Anyway, that done, you can then glue the halves together. Back to the wings. And if you're doing the wings unfolded, then you put this brace in on either side to support the outer panels. Now I'm having the wings folded, so I'm fitting these blanking hinge pieces at the end of the stub. Then I can add the top surface of the inner wings. The outer panels come in halves, of course. The first thing to do is to cut off these hinge cover plates. Then add the blanking piece to the inside end, same yellow colour of course. Pop the other skin on and tape it all up to set. Back to the fuselage and I'm adding the control surfaces. First the tailplanes go on. Then the elevators in the back of those, and finally the rudder at the back of the fin. The ailerons can go into the finished outer wing sections as well. A couple of other things to do, assemble the wheels. Take care to line up the flat spots properly. Now I need to make some canopy masks, so what I do is lay over some masking tape on the part, push into the corners of the frame with a wooden stick and then cut into the frame edge with a very sharp point of a knife or a scalpel. For the canopy, I use plastic tape for the curved edges, then paper for the rest. The windshield goes into place in the fuselage with some clear PVA such as contactor clear or micro crystal clear. Leave that a while to dry, I'd say an hour at the very least. Now I've sealed off the cockpit and primed the plane. Now I'm adding some black pre-shading lines. I've never done this before, so I thought I'd see whether it works. Then a coat of Sky Type S on the undersides and most of the side of the fuselage and the tail. When it's dry, tape off the... When it's dry, tape it up and then spray the top of the fuselage and the upper surfaces of the wings and tail with extra dark sea grey. The cowling and propeller boss are going to be orange, so I've given them a coat of light grey as a base. And when that's dry, the orange can go on. With the huge propeller, I've masked the tips, and then I'm adding some white as a base coat, followed by the final yellow. Now with the spraying done on the plane, I can add a coat of varnish and then start on the decals. Now remember to use Plenty of decal setting solutions such as decal fix or micro set to help get it into the cracks. The canopy that I masked earlier has been given some black primer around the edges. Then I'll add the top coat of extra dark sea grey. 
I've also put some black primer onto the exhaust shields. When that's dried, I'll add dark aluminium. And back on the cowling, I'll pick out those lovely exhaust stubs with burnt iron. Then the cowling can go onto the nose. More decals and these stupid things are supposed to represent the lights. Really not very good when even a 172nd Tempest has proper clear panels. Anyway after that onto the gear and the main legs attached to the main gear doors like so. Then the main leg sits into a kind of cup in the wing. And then you add this actuator. One end goes into the back of the spar here. The other has two prongs that fit into the bottom of the gear leg. When it's all put together, it's really quite sturdy. The inner gear door goes into place and it's held upright in position by those little actuators we saw earlier. If you're lucky, they won't be broken by now. Then the wheels can go on. Do double check the position of the flat spot. It should be towards the tail end of the plane. The tail wheel assembly comes in two parts. This leg pokes through the frame, then attaches to it. The leg then sits at the back of the tail wheel bay, the tail wheel retracted forwards on the Sea Fury. Then the tail wheel itself can go on. followed by the tail gear doors. There is another small door to add to each main gear leg. Then the arrestor hook can be put in. The small end hooks over a peg built into the bottom of the tail. Then there's a small stirrup for the pilot. This can be out or retracted as you wish. Now I'm taking the masks off the windshield and canopy and checking the paint lines. Now the propeller, there's a shaft that pokes through the back of the fuselage plate, through the base plate and into the propeller itself. The spinner then sits on top. Just touch up all the orange around the bottom, then the propeller assembly can go into the nose. Looks great. Next, the main wing hinge goes into each stub. Leave it to dry for a while. And in that time, I can complete the wings with the lamps. I can add the pitot tube. And while I think about it, add the canopy to the fuselage. Then with the hinges fixed, I can slot the outer wing panels on top. There are two other pieces that stick up to contact the outer panel for it to sit firmly and at the right angle. If one side is more folded than the other, just support it at the correct angle while it dries. Then go around with a quick touch up of all the paint and my Sea Fury is complete. There we have it. You know, I really, really, really wanted to love this kit and I'm afraid I really, really can't. Um, the issue with the engine cowling is just awful how they didn't spot that in production builds i have no idea the actuators for the uh, main wheel doors that stick out the bottom and get broken why couldn't they just have been pieces that you added later on i don't know anyway other than that it's a nice kit it's not a great kit it's not as great as for example the most recent hurricane but you know if you want a sea fury it's pretty good and the decal options are quite sweet. I do like orange, so I got to build a Dutch one. There we have it, the Hawker Sea Fury, not without some problems in terms of a kit, um, but do you know what? It's okay, it's all right. It's not the greatest kit in 148th Airfix have done recently, but it's not the worst either. 
it's a nice sea fury and I do like orange so I got to build a Dutch one which is fantastic now remember if you enjoy the video please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already the link is down there in the bottom right corner just click on the logo thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time